we all do, truth be known. It's part of who we are as humans. But the most important thing is it's the most important, dis important distinguishing characteristic of us as followers of the Lord. So if we love the Lord, if we follow the Lord, we just forgive. That's just who we are. If we don't, we need to. And that's what I hope will happen today as a result of the words that God's given me this morning. We have all heard countless sermons. We've read books. We've read the word. We all know the account of Jesus and the torture and the events that he went through for our redemption, to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven. We even know that the, the word for the, the clinical medical definition for sweating drops of blood is hematidrosis. I mean, we, we know about this. We know, most Americans know the story of Calvary. They know what Jesus did. As Christians, we hear it at least several times a year, very least at least once a year. And yet, somehow, we still think we have the right and we still think that we're justified to hold on to unforgiveness. We think that the acts that were done to us, that's different. This hurt me. This offended me. They talked rudely to me. So we remain angry and bitter towards our offenders, thinking that it only affects us and that relationship, which is a deception. So we avoid talking to certain people, we avoid going to certain places, we avoid certain subjects we don't want to talk about because we want to stay away from the fact that we're holding something captive in our hearts that we clearly understand is not God's will. I'm trying to think how long ago, when the Passion of the Christ came out, we had just been through a series of events in our lives. We actually, we weren't through it. We were in the middle of it. David and I had pastored this church about eight years. And uh, many of you know, I've told the stories, you know, I worked very, very hard in the church. I was a full-time employee at the church and I was a full-time stay-at-home mom. So that, if that explains anything. So sleeping is what I never did. <laughs> I considered my gifts to the church and to the Lord as a sacrifice, but it was a sacrifice that I was happy to make. Um, I sacrificed my health, I sacrificed a career, I sacrificed time with my boys, and I sacrificed time with family events. But I always felt that they were justified and that doing the work of the Lord was more important. My brother had been a quadriplegic since 1984, and my parents both became what was terminally ill for my mother and what would be an 11-year battle for my dad to date. And so at this time, my mother was in chemo. My dad was just had had extensive sur surgery. Yet I was still leading a Bible study of ladies. And at one of the Bible studies, and some of you have heard this story before, and I apologize if you have, but this is one of the single most difficult events in my life to overcome. And if you knew the story of my life, you would think, really? <laughs> that? But after having given so much, I felt, after being so willing to do and give and be involved in, I felt that my friends at the church turned completely against me. I missed a Thursday, a Thursday evening Bible study because my mother was supposed to be having chemo that day, and she was too ill to take the chemo. Excuse me. <clears throat> I called a very capable lady and asked her if she would fill in for me. She said she would. I took off to Bryan, Texas, which was about 150 miles away. Took care of my mother, returned only to have one of my closest friends, who was also a colleague in ministry, just completely... Uh, just ream me out is the only way I know how to say it. She told me that I had neglected my duties, that I was ir irresponsible, that I didn't care about the church. 
Now, to someone who's given so much, you know how, what that feels like when you feel like you've given and given and given. My whole life was about caring for the church. My whole life was about being there when they needed me. And now I'm being called irresponsible and uncaring. And I didn't even know yet that the lady I had asked to fill in for me hadn't shown up. So the lady didn't show up. This lady, who had been one of my dearest friends, is just completely, I'm talking quivering jaw, tears. She's really upset with me. And others began to act in kind. They, they followed her leadership and said, yeah, why didn't you take care of that? Well, I didn't realize at the time just how deep that pain was and just how deep and how much resentment and how much of a failure I felt like at that time and how long I would carry that with me. But David and I went to see the Passion of the Christ. That was about the time when that was going on. And I remember just going into the bathroom after the movie and just sobbing, just standing in the bathroom and just sobbing because I remember thinking, Lord, you went through that from my sins and yet I'm having trouble forgiving these people for this? And I thought it was done. I didn't eat for three days after I saw the Passion of the Christ. I shook every time I thought about it. It deeply touched, touched me. And I thought I was done. I thought, okay, I get it. But what I didn't know was I, I, it wasn't over. I had a mental concept of Jesus did this for me, and now I need to do it for others. But letting go was a different story. And so every time that something would come up and it would be time for me to give or it would be time for me to do, the brakes came on. I had a problem saying no, of course, and many of you know that, and you know that from articles I've written too, but, you know, I just couldn't tell anyone no. If they thought I should be doing something, I just did it. And, you know, I just thought, well, if that's what it takes to make you happy, well, here, that's easy. I didn't realize that was impossible. I wasn't really the Lord. I was just working for him. <laughs> but, but that had become a real issue for me. One day, I was doing my afternoon walk and a friend of mine called and I still remember where I was when she asked me this question because I had just expressed some things to her about how I felt about the church and this friend of mine asked me she said you're not becoming like Jonah are you and I thought Jonah hated the church I don't hate the church of course not that's ridiculous years later after fighting and fighting and trying so hard to forgive and so hard to let it go, I would pray and I would go, go through communion and I would say, Lord, I lay it down, I forgive, I forgive the church. Now, when I say the church, now you're probably thinking I'm thinking of the building and the people in it at that city. No, I'm much more efficient than that. This was the church global. This was, um, you know, I can, I can dream up ways to, to find to have resentment. And so I would think that I had laid it down. And the next time something would happen that would be required, something was required of me or no. no. I mean, it was just something would come up in me and I realized that thing wasn't gone at all. So I began to really pray. What I didn't realize, I had hardened my heart. And what I spoke a moment ago about how that we think that we could, when we have unforgiveness, we think it's about that person or about that organization. And what we don't realize is that we don't have control over hardening our hearts. When you turn your heart off in one area, it begins to die in all areas. Ask a cardiologist. You can't have one ventricle that doesn't work. You'll die. You, you, know, you, you can't just have one that just, you just say, oh, well, I'll let that one go. You can't survive. And you can't survive as a Christian when you just decide that you're just not going to love in this one area. Because Jesus is the living Lord, and he wants every part of us living with him and in him. So I prayed, and I told God that I didn't. I read the story of Jonah, and I said, Lord, I don't want my story to end like Jonah. He's sitting under a worm-eaten vine, hating the Ninevites. I knew I didn't hate the church, but I just couldn't trust the church anymore. I couldn't trust those friends. I couldn't trust those people. 
because I had felt like I had given all and then it was just completely taken advantage of, not appreciated, and demanding for more. And so I, I did not understand. I had no concept how I could get back to the point where I could trust again and where I could love again like I had before because before I just freely gave. If you needed me, I don't care what time it was, I was there. Some of the reasons that we hold on to unforgiveness are that, number one, they don't deserve to have our unforgiveness. They don't deserve to have our forgiveness because the acts against us were so great. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. And if you told me, you know, about some things that people had done to you, I could probably agree with you and say, boy, that's true. That's terrible. And I've heard people say this. No, no one could ever get over that, whatever it might be. But the truth is that God is holy. And if we've done the slightest, smallest wrong against him, it's greater than the greatest wrong against us because of who he is and who we are. And I'll talk more about his holiest, holiness in a moment. The number two reason is that if I forgive them, they're just going to do it again. And that was my big hang-up. If I open my heart then that's, that makes no sense to me at all. That would just be laying down and just saying, okay, come on, be terrible to me again. <laughs> Number three, I think, is the worst problem of all, and that is when you have told yourself and you can convince yourself that you just don't care anymore. And you've written them off, and you just have decided put them out of your life. And that way, you don't have to deal with your unforgiveness. You don't have to deal with their bad behavior. And you don't have to feel vulnerable that they could ever hurt you again. You've solved the problem. To say, I don't care, to write someone off out of your life, that's just check. That's taken care of. Unfortunately, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man but in the end, it leads to death. All of our logic, all of our understanding humanly about how to react to things and how to feel and how to live after there's been an offense, they could make perfect sense to us. You could completely convince me to write someone out of your life, to just say, be gone with you, it per makes perfect sense to Rhonda Johnson if they've hurt you. Just stay away from them. And that, I mean, that just sounds like something I would think of. <laughs> just, just, if they're not in your life, how can they hurt you? The odd thing and the awful thing about unforgiveness is you can take that person out of your life, but if you hold them in your heart, they're still in your life and they are still damaging you. They are still creating a chasm between you and God Almighty. Physics and logic can put a man on the moon, but logic can send us to hell. Because our sin and our unforgiveness causes us to separate ourselves from God. And anytime we're separate from him and we're not receiving from him and we're not in his presence, we're walking further and further away. Our hearts are becoming harder and harder. And it becomes harder to love people who've done nothing wrong to us, but we just don't have as much of a feeling. Our heart has died. <coughs> Isaiah 55, 9 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That scripture can cover a lot of issues in our lives. Because so many times our logic and our calculations make perfect sense to us. But if we know God, if we know his word, then we know that's not how we're supposed to behave. By that I mean what we come up with is not how we're supposed to behave. 1 Corinthians six nineteen twenty says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This one is the one that just kept haunting me, this scripture. 
because I knew that I was born again. I knew that I belonged to God. Yet I just didn't want to do it his way. I just couldn't seem to let go. I couldn't seem to get over it. I tried. I honestly tried. I thought I tried. But if we belong to Christ, then we don't have a choice in how to behave. We have to forgive. We have to love one another. We have, and that's just, we don't have a question about it anymore. Did your parents have rules that you just had to do? I mean, maybe you didn't even understand it. You know, you thought to yourself, you know what? I know my boys tell me, Mom, I'm going to be rich when I grow up, and I'm going to have yard guys. I don't need to know how to mow the yard, you know. <laughs> and, and uh you know, sometimes we have things like that where we just think, you know, I don't need to know how to iron my jeans. When I grow up, I'm not going to iron jeans anymore. But your mother still makes you iron your jeans, or mine did anyway. And so there are things that God requires of us that maybe in our own minds we think are useless. But God knows everything there is to know about us. And he knows that we need to forgive because that person deserves it? No. Because it frees us from holding on to things that will damage our heart, that will cause our heart to die, that will cause us to not hear God's voice and not know his way. Jesus bought us and he paid for us. If we gave ourselves to him, then we gave ourselves away. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to him now. And we're now dependent on God and walking in his way. I love, to me, Paul just sums it all up in Ephesians when he says that he refers to himself as a slave to the gospel. And what that means to me is it just, it doesn't matter what I think anymore. It doesn't matter what I want anymore. It's all about what God says and what the gospel says. So our reasons, I want to take these three reasons once again and look at them more closely they don't deserve my my forgiveness they don't deserve it what they've done to me is too is too unforgivable it's too great an offense god is holy as i said before and all of our offenses all of them are too great for us to be forgiven when we compare ourselves with god's perfect only son I'd like to read some scripture, and this is a lot of scripture. Would you be patient with me while I prove a point? This is Job chapter 38. Thank you. <laughs> and it's 33 verses. And I tried and I tried to think of where to cut this off. But my point is sort of to overwhelm you. I mean, that really is where I'm going with this. And yet, I think, okay, 33 verses, that is a lot of scripture to read. Read the book of Job. If this is just a tiny portion of what I could have chosen. And I, I, I really, I want for you to hear this. Now, this is, this is Job's friends are questioning and asking and, and questioning God and, and trying so hard to persuade Job to doubt God and to turn away from God. And then the Lord answered, the word says, he answered Job out of the storm, and he says, Who is this that, dark, that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness when I fixed the limits for it and set its doors and bars in place when I said this far you may come and no further here is where your proud waves halt have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake out the wicked of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? 
Have the gates of hell been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you are already born. You've lived so many years. I love it. God's a little sarcastic there. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war or battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no man in it, to satisfy a desolate, a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters come hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth constellations in their seasons or lead out a bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? Who, is the, who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clots of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wonder about the lack for food? Job's response to this, if you continue to read to the end of the chapter, is he says, no plan of yours can be thwarted. I'm just dust. The more we read, the more we know about who our God is, how holy he is, and what he's up to when he isn't answering our prayers and being awesome to us should make us never, ever begin to question or think that if he says, I've forgiven you, now you forgive those who offend you. Can we doubt for a moment that we have any right to think that we can hold anything in our heart when God Almighty, this God, this is one chapter, read the whole book, when one chapter can just make us just completely blow our minds. If you could take any one of those scriptures and just think about it for days, about how great God is, to think that he himself leads the, the, the bear and the cubs out of the den. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And he says, forgive, because I have forgiven you. God Almighty, in all his greatness, gave you and I forgiveness. And I ask the question, have we lost our minds to think that we have any right to be angry with others? God is holy, and he will never require our forgiveness. There's a, there's a theory that's out right now, and it drives me insane, and that is that we need to forgive God for things. I, there's even a book on the marketplace right now, When I Forgave God. That may not be the actual title, but it's something like that. That is, I, I mock that. <laughs> I mock that with all my heart. To say that God Almighty has ever disappointed me, that he has ever come short or failed, that he's ever offended me, that is just complete misunderstanding of anything. The person who thinks that way, I wouldn't trust them at all, with anything at all. They've, God is not a person that he can make a mistake or that he can do something wrong. 
and will never require our forgiveness. If you're ever tempted to think or say that, stop yourself. If you've ever thought it in the past, repent and ask God to forgive you and realize that that's wrong thinking. The second answer was that if I forgive them, they'll do it again. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 Jesse, can I see that, please? It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me, this is Jesus, Isaiah is prophesying Jesus. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Yes, people are going to hurt us again. But the Lord of glory the maker of heaven and earth lives inside of us and he's faithful. He came for the purpose of binding up our broken hearts. So when someone does offend us, break our hearts again, hurt our feelings, make us mad, Jesus Christ lives in us so that we, and we can freely forgive others just like God freely forgives us. Uh, Peter came to Jesus and said, and in and, and my thinking, Peter was probably thinking that he was being extra merciful because he was talking to the Son of God. And he said, Jesus, he said, how, much, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? And I think he was probably thinking like I would have, and that is like, seven, that's a lot. Seven times, you think? And Jesus' answer, as we all know, was no, 70 times seven. Now, to my brain, that's 490 so we start like keeping toothpicks or something to keep track of things. But that wasn't Jesus' point. Jesus' point was over and over and over again. What is our greatest example for forgiveness over and over and over again? Any one of us, our own selves. We are the example for that because we sin over and over again and over again and the Lord is faithful to forgive us of our sins the word says I, wor I worked at a job and I was uh, working late coming in early and um, I was given on top of my already pretty heavy load I was given a new project and I thought how in the world am I going to do this so a co-worker came in to me and she said you know what this this area this new project is one of the few areas where our jobs overlap. She said, my husband is going to be working on a project, and he'll be working late for the next several months. How about if I take this part? She said, I work with these same people that you do. I'll take care of this thing. And she had this wonderful spreadsheet and everything, and she had already done a lot of work and, and offered to help me with this part of the job. I said, are you sure you don't mind? No, I'm going to be here anyway. My husband's working late every night for the next three months. Oh, well, okay, I said. After a few weeks, I was called into my boss's office because my coworker had told him that I had dumped the project on her. She showed him her work schedule and showed how that she had been staying until 7 o'clock at night, every night, along with me. And she let him know that I was derelict in my duties not only not was I not doing it but I had dumped it on her the biggest problem I had was she was the one believer along with me in the office <laughs> it really irritated me to say the least and I thought of all kinds of ways to respond but typically when I'm overwhelmed I just don't say anything I think about it and so I didn't say anything and I left his office and I just, I was, I was hurt, I was disappointed, I was overwhelmed, I was in trouble <laughs> at my job, and I just thought, oh my word, so I felt in my heart as I would pray not to do anything, just rest, just wait. I already knew that this lady had some major problems. And so I began to pray for her because we're supposed to pray for those who despitefully use us, the word says. I felt like if there was ever a perfect example of despitefully used, I had it living color right down the hall. 
So I began to pray for her. And I want to give you an example of, you know, just praying like you're talking to a friend. And I just told the Lord, Lord, you know this is dead wrong. <laughs> you know that, you know that this is unjust. This is a lie. You know that, you know. And I just began to pour out my heart to the Lord. Well, as time went by, my boss realized because of some other things that it wasn't me. So God vindicated me with my boss. I never said a word to the lady who did this. As a result, she had some family trouble, some very serious family trouble. And of course, who does she come to but the one that she knows will pray? And I was able to pray with her and forgive her through ministry. I had to minister to her. So I had to forgive her. I couldn't, I couldn't sit and pray with her with, about her family trouble while I'm going, you undercutting, <laughs> low snake belly, you know. <laughs> I had to let it go. With the help of the Lord, I had to let it go. If I had gone and taken on that situation head to head, if I had handled it like I knew how to handle it from an HR perspective, if I had made a case for myself and won, which I could have done, would I have been in a position to minister to her when she needed me? No, she would have seen me as an enemy. Forgiveness is vital. As Christians, we have to walk a different walk and we have to walk on a higher road than those that we're walking with in this life. The purpose of our breathing is to serve and live for the Lord. It's not for ourselves. It's not to make money. It's not for career advancement. It's so that God Almighty can use us for his purpose. And that was only, I, I don't give that example as any kind of, look at me, I did so well. I'm telling you, I relied completely and wholly on the Lord to get me through that because trust me, that is not how I wanted to handle the situation. <laughs> The third thing is that you don't care. Proverbs 10, 12 says, but love covers all wrongs. To not care is contrary to the heart and the life of Jesus. We have to care. We have to love people. John 13, 35 says, by this they will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So do you call yourself a Christian? There's a litmus test every single time you have an opportunity to be hateful, spiteful, or even stick up for yourself sometimes, or be loving. If you choose anything but to love people, do they really think we're good Christians? Do they really think we're followers of the Lord? Unforgiveness problems oftentimes are love problems. There are problems with our hearts. As I said before, you can't shut off a chamber of your heart and survive it. And you can't shut off loving someone and survive as a Christian. Your, your Christian integrity will not be intact if you just decide to stop loving. We're not given that luxury. We're not given that option as believers, as followers of the Lord, our hearts have to remain beating for every person, for your neighbor, for your, all of your family, your extended family, all of the people that you work with, all of the people that you know, the people that you're in clubs and organizations with, the people who are constantly trying to belittle or make you look bad. You know, it took me years, but I finally realized what the problem was with that lady at our church previously who said that I dropped the ball and didn't take care of things and how that I was negligent. She was disappointed that I didn't ask her to take the class. And it doesn't matter the reason, we still have to love people. That family, and I, I'm embarrassed to say it hasn't been that long ago, I had an opportunity. They needed something and I had an opportunity to bless. And so I thought to myself, okay, I know what I'm gonna do for them. 
And I had in my head, I'm going to bless them. And that's going to show, that's going to seal my forgiveness. It's going to show that I am over this. And the Lord spoke to me to do twice as much as what I had planned to do. <laughs> the Lord is good. And as I did it, I didn't, I, I was happy to do it. I was like, okay, I'm twice as over it as I thought I was. <laughs> And I went ahead and I did twice as much as I had originally planned. And I was excited about that because to me that was a benchmark of my heart that I had overcome. I really had forgiven. I really had gotten over. You might be trying to forgive someone. There may be someone you're mad at. And you're thinking to yourself, I've tried. Just like you're saying, I've tried and I just can't do it. It's just not happening. Every time I think I'm over it, it comes back. And I realize I'm still mad. Every time it comes back, remind yourself. Stop your thoughts. Stop yourself and say, I've forgiven them in Jesus' name. Eventually, it won't be. It won't be a problem. You won't be angry anymore. You will have truly let it go. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who enables me. We're going to pray in a little bit for our neglected and abused children in our county. But before we do, I want to tell you a story about a little girl whenever I worked at the elementary school. As a little girl, a lady came in and she said that she was with the state of Texas and she was here to pick up a first grader whose mother was in jail. And she was going to take her to Gatesville, Texas to visit with her mother. Well, I've spoken in Gatesville, Texas, and I know how far that is. And um, I, I just, I said, well, what do you have for this child, you know, for the trip? Well, she just thought I was crazy, you know. Well, what do you mean, what do I have for her? I said, do you have anything for her to do? Do you have a snack? You know, what, what do you have for her? So I put her through the rigors and took her badge and made a copy and, and bought myself some time to get some things gathered up. And the whole time my heart was just, devastated. I thought, this poor child is going to go with a stranger. That's, that's over 150 miles from here. And I'm just devastated for this little girl who's going to spend the next four hours in a car with a stranger to go visit her mother in jail. And so I got everything in order and took care of everything and made sure that everything was legitimate. And then I went down to get the little girl. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm just, my, my stomach is just in knots. I'm just feeling so bad for this child whose mother is in jail and I'm just wondering what is she going to be like what what must this child be dealing with with her mother in jail and thinking of driving four hours with a stranger so I went to get the little girl and I said I said hey I said um there's a lady here and she says mm -hmm. she's going to take me to see my mom and I said well, yeah, I said, you don't know this lady, do you? She said, no, she didn't care. She was getting to go see her mom. Didn't worry her one bit. Worried me, didn't worry her at all. <laughs> so we walk into the office, and what I saw was the most precious, touching thing. This little girl, well, I've, I pray for her every time I think of her. I have for all these years walks up to this total stranger, and while I'm gathering the things, I look up, and the little girl has taken the hand of this stranger that I'm so worried about, and she just is looking up at her like she is an angel from the Lord. The forgiveness and the love, this little girl didn't have one bit of offense or animosity or any kind of stress about this lady or about her mom, she had, she was just, it was her mom. She was excited to go see her mom. And I just think so many times about a child, Jesus tells us to be like children. And I told the ladies in the Bible study recently that I've asked the Lord to help me to be like I was when I was a child. I could be upset with someone when I was a child, and as soon as I saw them, I just forgot about it. It just went away. And I've asked the Lord to help me do that. But do you know what the Lord has shown me? That I can do that. But that I have to decide to do that as an adult. As a child, it just happens. As an adult, we decide. 
But when we decide, it's not in our own might or our own power, but it's in Jesus who enables us, who, uh, who will help us to forgive any offense. Would you stand with me, please, and let's pray. When you decide to follow the Lord, he does the hard stuff. He says to be yoked with him because his yoke is easy. He wants to carry the burden, and the burden is sometimes unforgiveness. I'd like for you to please bow your heads with me. Lord, right now we just lift up a prayer for the neglected and the abused in our county. I pray, Lord, that you'd touch every child that's in foster care. There are 33 of them. Lord, I pray that you touch every person on the board for CPS. I ask that you touch every person who oversees this department in our country. Lord, these children will someday be faced with forgiveness they'll need to forgive some parents for neglect some parents for their actions and father we're not any different than they are we stand here today lord many of us with hearts that have prisoners in them of offense things that we haven't forgotten about things that are painful to remember things that are too hard to forget we think but, Lord, we know that in you we can do this because you've told us to, and you certainly wouldn't tell us to do something that was too difficult. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask right now for you to open the prison doors of our hearts. And, Lord, we pray for us to let our captors go free. Lord, whether it was offenses when we were children, whether it was offenses of neglect, or omission, whether we were forgotten, whether there was physical harm or inappropriate actions, Lord, if it's that someone has talked harshly to us, that someone has degraded us, if it's that someone hasn't treated us with respect, if it's that someone has assumed the worst of us. Father, in Jesus' name, we let it all go free. We stand with a heart full of your love today and your affection. Lord, we ask for you to, to put in us a supernatural love as we choose to love these people who have hurt us. Father, we just ask in your precious name for you to guard our hearts now and not allow any new prisoners to come in, but to keep us free from any, any harboring of any unforgiveness, Lord. Lord, we just thank you so much for these things. Thank you so much, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.